I want to open this morning with a, a hearty good morning to you. Good morning. I wanted to open my prayer that I do every morning when I wake up. Um, you know, there used to be an old joke that, that they had in the Marine barracks that says, every morning when I touch my feet on the floor, the devil says, oh hell, he's awake. You know, um, my prayer is this that I say every morning. I say, Father, I am a sinner. Please forgive me. And I know only you can help me through your son, Jesus Christ. That's my morning prayer. As simple as it is, it tells the foundation of where I am theologically, looking from a bi biblical theological stance at the cross, and from Romans 7 and Romans 8. Now we had a discussion about this last week a little bit on how this goes in. So you see how God's time, we're slipping into that beautiful realm where God is allowing a lot of our answers to be answered through the outpouring of his Holy Spirit and through his word that is given to us every week. I'm not complacent and I pray that you're not with my sins. I'm not. I detest them just as God hates them. Maybe more. I'm more critical of myself. And I can't do anything about it. That's what hurts me. But God knows that, and that makes me feel better. And we all should feel that way. Now, as a priest, I follow all the rules that are set up. I do. You know, I, I, I care for all of you and your problems better than I care for my own sometimes. And that's my selfishness. Because we all are selfish in reality. My selfishness, my field of need, or my field of being fulfilled is to help other people. That's my selfishness is to seem or do unselfish things where I care for everybody else. As a priest, I write one book report a week, right? My sermon. I do one book report a week. Whenever I had students at Valdosta State, they're like, oh, man, we got to do so much writing. Uh, get in line. <laughs> you know, I don't want to hear it. I go to all my priestly classes that the diocese tells me to. I do my pastoral visits when I'm supposed to do. I say the Mass right for the most part. Uh, the Greek Orthodox had a great tradition where they would screw up one thing in the Mass just to show that they're falling. But sometimes I get so caught up in my actions as a priest that I turn these things, they become for me a god with a small g. That's why sometimes I don't wear a collar. Or I'll wear jeans. Or I won't do as much emphasis at the altar because I, I have to be mindful that I don't turn it into a god with a small g. <clears throat> I try to do all the things that man has asked me to do as a priest, but St. Paul was in that same way, and he explains it today as Bianca read that. He was, how does he say it? I am the Jew of Jews. Right? He followed every rule set in stone to be Jewish. If he was asked to tithe 10%, he gave 20%. If he was asked to, according to the law, to uh, fast for a day, he'd fast for two. He would be, if we had a treasure in this church, he would be their golden child. Oh, good. We're going to put that new wing on the church, or we're going to put in that new air conditioner. They wanted more of St. Paul as the Pharisee in the church. But I, like Paul at times, take delight in the law of God. But my body, completely as should yours, fights what my mind knows what to do that is right in God's eyes. This reading from the book of Romans explains that fight and also what God knows our fight and what he has done to correct it. Not what you can do. 
Paul explains in there, it's not about me, stupid. We are all in that same boat with St. Paul. But in reality, our body works against itself and against God at times. And because of this inner fighting that happens between us, that's why I say the longest road in America is from our heart to our head. Is the longest road in America. We can never fully follow God's law. Why? Just because just as Paul states here, because in the reality of this, the law can never rescue us from our predicament. If you read the law without knowing what happened on Good Friday, it is nothing but damnation. It is nothing but damnation. So I ask you, which commandment do you think you break the most? Just think in your heads. I think of all of our problems is because we break this co commandment the worst, covet. Covet. And why? Because the world pushes that on us. Your car is not quite good enough. You need a new Equinox. You know? Your breath is not quite the same, so you need whiter teeth using this. I covet to have those white teeth. How many teenage young women go through all the issues with diets and food and so forth because the world wants her this way? Covet. Covet. Now, once we face that we are always coveting what we don't have, but we want, we covet a better house, we covet our better paycheck, we covet a better looks, we covet God's power. Our obsession with what we don't have is so unbelievable, and it runs most of our lives. Golfers are the worst at this. You are. If all of a sudden the club that you have only gets it 150 yards out and there's a new club out there with a swing handle that are correct for your, instead of you choking up on the club, what are you going to do? You're going to covet and you're going to go buy that new $825 club. Am I wrong? No. <laughs> or this ball goes further. If you just get this ball, it'll go a little further. You covet that new ball. I know, I sat and watched golf with these two right here, right before the Super Bowl, and I, I, there was a lot of coveting going on in my house. I can't believe this guy didn't finish this game off. Coveting. I could have done it better. Our obsession with what we don't have is unbelievable. Okay? St. Paul is trying in this morning's epistle to warn us with a loud warning that all of us, that we can never please God by our own efforts because our desire for what we don't have will always get in our way. We'll always get in our way. We can never fulfill his law. We will always be confessing on what we, what, uh, that we are debtors to grace. I find that people that Kvetch the most about a certain issue is because it's something that they're either wrestling with or they've wrestled with. Do you honestly believe that you're following the Ten Commandments is what you need to be good with God? Really? And we've discussed this when we studied Galatians last summer. And I think there came a reality check as to what the law was really about. Because most Americans believe that if they are good people to each other, they'll be okay with God. When, church, when cities get knocked down because they take a monument of the Ten Commandments away, that shouldn't affect us. Yeah, it's a holy law, but it's an old covenant. It's a law that was set up to show us how we should live, but we know now, because of the cross, we can never live up to that law. So let me remind you of the coveting problem we have. 
Most Americans believe that if they're good with each other, they'll be okay with God. Or even worse is when someone thinks that they go to church or they pray every so often, they'll be okay with God. They'll be okay with God. Some people come to church thinking that this is a country club without carts or club rentals. It's a social club. Scripture has never said that. Scripture has never said that if you go to church and you pray, you'll be okay with God. But it does say that we are to be together to worship God together. And that's what we come here for. The famous line from James Bond, for those of you who know, I am a huge James Bond fan. I am a huge James Bond fan. I have every movie. I have every book. I mean, I am just, I loved the original books that are harder and harder to find uh, because of copyright laws. There was a line that was put out there in um, the third film with Daniel Craig. And it's when the new Q comes in. Have you all seen the film Skyfall? Has everybody seen that film? If you haven't, you're a communist. It it's really is one of the best films out there. I think it, because it goes back to the roots. It goes back to what James Bond really was. Not the Roger Moore with all his little Lamborghini and jet ski garbage. This was raw. Hey, I got to think. I got to listen. I got to act. Okay? The new Q shows up. He's a young guy. And James Bond looks at him and he goes, you still got spots. What does that mean? He's young, right? He's a deer. He's a fawn. You still got spots. And he says, well, don't let inex youth and inexperience undetect what I can really do. He says, I can do more. This is the new Q speaking, who's young. He says, I can do more in the morning in my pajamas on my laptop with a cup of Earl Grey than you can do as a spy. And James Bond looks at him square in the face. He says, that's true. But you do need somebody to pull the trigger. You can go home today, right now, instead of coming here together to worship God. And you can listen to church on TV. You can listen to sermons online. And not even bother to come together. Not bother coming every Sunday. You could sit in your pajamas, on your laptop, sipping your old bread. Pearl Gray is tea for those of you that are not English, but remember, we just passed July 4th, so you dump that in the bag. Um, <laughs> sorry, Rosie. That <laughs> That's why we come to church. We come to church not saying that. I'm coming to church and I'm going to be good with God. We come to church to be with each other, to, to laugh with each other, to cry with each other, to share with each other, to be as a family is what Christ calls us. You can't say this many Hail Marys and get a special dispensation for all your sins or the other. You can't put more in the plate in the week, although I'd love it. Uh, you can't have been a bad uh, by making up for all your sinfulness by putting a little extra in the plate. You can't. You can't come here and do something around the church on Sundays to make up for the previous six days that you're doing whatever you wanted. It doesn't work that way. That's not what church is about. That's not what being a Christian is about. God knows you and God knows me and he knew from the beginning that there was no way that you or I could ever get on his good side with what we can do on our own. He knew it so well that he sent up a plan. He set this plan up from the beginning of creation. And for those of you that read The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, you understand the impact that this discussion between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit happened at Genesis 1. When Aslan was killed, the sacrifice for everybody who had no sin, Aslan said right to the kids, the white witch didn't understand because she was not there at the beginning when we talked, that this was going to happen from the beginning. 
She didn't know that Aslan was on the move. She didn't know that Aslan was going to rise up from the dead and help. So you want to get good with God. Well, I'll tell them, let me tell you what God has done. As if you never heard it from me say before. But God has made it right through the act of his son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. And with all that we do, we receive his blessing that God has done is to accept him as our Lord and Savior. That's it. To get all the graces that God gives us. All we have to do is accept the story that Jesus died on the cross on Good Friday. He raised from the grave on Sunday and that he is your Lord and Messiah. That's it. You made that promise for Ryder at this very pulpit when, you, when we baptized him. Do you renounce Satan and all his... I do, with God's help. When you fall from away, when you sin, what are you going to do? I'm going to go back to God and ask for his help. And prayerfully not shoot Mo Green in the eye. See, we went right back to Vegas. Isn't that cool? You just... <laughs> right back. This is what I call grace and the good news. And for a lot of people out there that go to churches nowadays, they think that there's acts that they have to do. But it's that easy. It's that easy. Did you know it was that easy when you first went to church? Probably not. We probably had parents that say, bow now, stand now, sit down, say this prayer. They never told us the story of grace. Do you still think that you need to put on a happy face and do all the right things to make God happy? It never says that in Scripture either. We're allowed to come in here and cry at the loss of our family. We're allowed to come in here and be mad at our family. We're allowed to come in here and be open and honest. If you could do it, why in the world would God send down his son if you could do it on your own? Why in the world would he do it? He can't, or you can't. What, that's an emergency plan he sent his son? No, you can't do it. We all can't cut the mustard. We are all, as, as they say in the King James Bible, we all sticketh, right? I love that word, it's only mentioned twice in the King James, sticketh. We all stinketh. Not one of us here is ever going to get, get there on our own without a savior. God has once and for all done away with the condemnation of our sins by that sacrifice on the cross. So the old you will let, look less and less appealing compared to the new you born again and what God really wants you to be here today. Not a competitor, uh, com competitor with earthly things, but one who gives everything God and seeks to attain heavenly things. A saint of the church of Christ who wants to see heaven here on earth just as it is in heaven. And that's what we pray in the Lord's Prayer, don't we? So let me close in prayer now. And I want you to think about how you've got your mind so twisted in logical reasoning that you're trying to be good with God by doing different actions where it's not about you. So let's pray. Father, we are all sinners. And God, please forgive us that we know only you can help us through what your son Jesus Christ did once and for all for us. We thank you, God, for loving us more than we love you. Father, we have deceived ourselves into thinking that we can do it alone. But Father, help us, we beg. Our Father in heaven, help us. And this we beg through your son Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.